Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Awkward Silences. Today, we're here with Eduardo Gomez Ruiz, who is a UX research manager at Miro. We're excited to have you back. We'd done a webinar together maybe a year and change ago. So excited to have you on a new topic and a new format. Thanks for joining us. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me here. We've got JH here too. Yeah, I know we're going to be talking about hybrid work, which is fascinating to me because I sort of get how doing in-person work is easy and makes sense. And I think fully remote people have gotten really good at, but the hybrid actually seems almost harder. So really uh, excited to hear what you've learned. Totally, totally. Yeah. I'll be happy to share some insights we got from our own research. And it's definitely a space that needs uh, constant experimentation. So yeah, happy to share with the community. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, I guess people have been doing hybrid work in some capacity for a while, but of course, this really got started with the pandemic when most knowledge workers were able to move remote or had to <laughs> move remote sort of full time all the time. And then as things began opening back up, it's like, okay, everyone back in the office, not let's do hybrid. And so now many companies are in this in between sort of spectrum of remote, hybrid, and office. And so, Eduardo, tell us what led you and the Miro team to look into researching this sort of meaty topic of mm -hmm. hybrid work and, you know, the future of it. And of course, you know, how does Miro fit into that? So, yeah, let me give you a little bit of context. This study was done in, in Q3 last year, 2021. At that time, Miro was experiencing this hyper growth, like the pandemic accelerated how people collaborated and then a whiteboarding like Miro was a, a go-to tool for many, many use cases. So the teams were pretty focused on short-term needs, like how can we cater to this demand? How can we cater to new ways of using Miro? And I was already seen from two quarters before, hey, the back to office, it's going to be imminent. I see countries like Israel already going almost full back to the office. Are we ready to support a new, a new normal, no? a new way of working? And then the answers were, well, we, we guess, but we cannot deviate our focus from these short-term needs. So then I thought, well, the beauty of being in research is that we can be thrown at the unknown spaces and bring a little bit more clarity, more direction. So it was at that time a research-led initiative. And that feels really good when we are given that liberty or autonomy to explore, uh, are we ready to stay relevant in this new paradigm? And, mm -hmm. and that was one of the biggest questions that, that I personally had. And then what I did was finding supporters and allies to make sure that we explore this topic as a joint effort and identify some patterns of behavior, some attitudes, and some new ways of working and thinking that were going to be well addressed and well met by the capabilities that Miro had. So I don't know if I answered completely your question, Look, but yeah, that's the idea that we anticipate what the needs are, and we start preparing ourselves, especially organizationally, right. for that. So you're building at the time to support this rapid growth, like you said, of people just, there's more people, right? So I imagine even just infrastructurally, you've got to deal with sort of that, like more people using you know, the app and existing obvious use cases, but you're saying, hey, this is starting to happen and we need to start understanding it now so we're ready for the next big change and what's coming. Exactly, the next waves of, product experiences and how people want to interact and collaborate with each other. Nice. That makes, I mean, makes a ton of sense. I'm curious, you kind of touched on it a little, when you started to go down this path of trying to understand this hybrid phenomenon, that's probably going to start occurring. How like broad was it? Did you have specific questions you wanted to answer or decisions you were looking to inform? Or is it more like purely generative? Like, let's just go out and, and see how people feel about it. And then we'll dial it in from there. Well, we had certain hypotheses because we, we read a lot of uh, reports that were out there. We also started to experience it ourselves. Uh, we are a globally distributed company. So we wanted to understand that overlap between devices, environment, and then culture and find the right spot or, or produce that best practices and best product experiences that can 
support people at the intersection of these three. So environment might be on the go, might be at home, might be at the office, might be in a booth in the office. <laughs> Devices might be your laptop. That was the normal back then. But then it might be an iPad, a mobile device, or simply yeah, the, the screen in the meeting room. And then we had different people with different attitudes towards facilitating and participating in the meetings, different concerns about safety. So we, we needed to be ready to see how all of these pieces come together and what's the best experience that we can offer at, at the overlap of, of those. Yeah, yeah. Would you put like going back to sort of like analog tools in the devices category? I just, uh, as an outsider thinking of this, right? Like it's this digital whiteboarding tool all of a sudden, me and some people are back in the office. Everyone's gotten the itch to get a marker and sticky notes out. I'm wondering, like, did that fit into it as well? We did, but to a lesser touch, like, because uh, given the time when we conducted this, this study, there were fewer people at the office. So normally the majority, and I'll share more about what type of sessions I, I observed, but the majority of attendees and hybrid meetings then were uh, joining remotely. So... It was a consideration and we discussed it with participants, but it wasn't the main focus. The idea is how can we stay relevant? And there are relevant topics in the room, like uh, that mm -hmm. physical touch, that uh, body language connection, the shared coffee, the, the smell, the space, the sense in each other. But yeah, there was less emphasis on analog tools like yeah, the pen and paper. Cool. So you said this was research-led research, which is really cool. I imagine that's uh, what a lot of researchers would love to be part of, given the choice. And so you had this idea, and it sounds like you had some buy-in and support right from the beginning. How did, correct me if I'm wrong, how did you go from idea, we want to research this, to then you know, getting the right stakeholders involved and really going into planning mode? So that was, I believe, the arduous process. Uh <laughs> uh -huh. Planning the research involved first finding the best partner in crime. That was my peer researcher, like Bo Liu. And then together, it was easier to, to plan and decide how are we going to fit in all of the pieces and how do we divide and conquer to find the right support. So we went, asked different product teams about their needs, about their roadmaps, and we were somehow gathering research questions to make them feel included in the process. And then we came up with this great idea. Let's, from the get-go, get leadership involved. So we got the CEO and the chief product officer to become part of the research process and join some co-creation sessions with users. So that meant that this was going to have high visibility. And then having them in the plan they made others be more interested, be more curious, and also want to be there and join and hear what the other person that they really admire is thinking or doing uh, in this space. How did you get them interested in being part of it? I imagine they're busy and, you know, people want them to be involved in their projects a lot. So, yeah, how did you get them to? to it was it? funny. There was one in-person event and I went straight to one of them and said, hey, <laughs> I need you here two or three weeks from now. Uh, this is what I'm cooking. And then he said, hell yeah. And then we toasted uh -huh. with, the, with the beer and there then was the agreement. Uh -huh. Yeah, no formal presentation, no formal pitch. I had clear clarity into what I needed from them and what they could get out of it. So then I just wanted them to sponsor uh, the project. Right. So you believed in your idea. You're like, this is going to be good research and you're, you, you're going to want to be involved. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And from, from that emotional resonance, they, mm -hmm. they were bought in. Nice. And then you called out earlier, like some of the hypotheses you had and some of these different categories you're exploring. Once you had that sort of core group of who's going to be involved, is that sort of the next step, like framing those hypotheses and stuff like that? Or when did those get created and how did they fit into the process? So we started with this research, complemented that with some questions we gather from different product teams, mm -hmm. and then we put them all together into a nice, neat research plan we did in Miro, saying, hey, these are the, the themes that we are going to explore. These are some of the research questions. 
And this is how we plan to, to tackle this in terms of methods. So we kind of translated those requests, the hypothesis and the, the needs that we anticipated seeing, and then we put them there together. How much of your methods and sort of study plan overall did you set up front and stick to versus how much did you iterate along the way? We kind of plan everything ahead of time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and went through it. Our original plan was we're going to do recruitment all together and then go through the different phases uh, of the research. But at the end, we the only iteration we did was that we could only recruit a few people when we were hoping to, and then we did it in two batches. So batch mm -hmm. one would be mm -hmm. first in participatory uh, observation session where we sat with them to see a hybrid mm -hmm. meeting or workshop. Sometimes we sat physically there with them if they were located in Amsterdam, or uh, we would join remotely. But we, were, we would be one more team member joining there. And as you can imagine, that was really hard to, to get consent to be part of because we are somehow strangers or outsiders in their uh, actual work time. So yeah, so that was the, the biggest iteration that we did not recruit all, at, all of them at once, but we, we did one first batch and then we continued with them and then a second batch and then they were almost running in parallel, but the first batch was of course uh, ending earlier. As user interviews, we think on the participant side of things a lot and the recruitment side. And just thinking through this one, it seems challenging in the sense, right? Of you think this future trend is coming and so you want to understand it, then you got to find people who are already ahead on that, right? Like sort of the early adopters of going back to hybrid. Were you able to do that through like signal you had in your product? Or how did you go about finding people who were kind of you know living in the future and, and already doing this hybrid stuff? So that was the second hardest part of, of the project. We initially thought that people were going to be open to it and they were not then we saw that those who were open may not have actual hybrid meeting the way we define it ahead of the project so then even if they wanted to participate there were not enough people in the office to for it to count as a hybrid meeting so we ultimately resource into our personal networks and people who trust us personally not as a company not as part of a middle okay. And then that was the, the best way to, to make it happen. So let's, let's talk about the details. Tell us about the study. So you, you have gathered your kind of a team of collaborators and stakeholders. You have some themes and questions you want to answer from talking to these product teams. And you've got this grand plan in, in Miro that you largely were able to stick to. So uh, what was the plan? What were some of the methods and how did you, how long did it take? Yeah, so the plan consisted of uh, three phases. Phase one, participatory observation of an actual hybrid meeting. Then phase two was follow-up interviews with a participant and a facilitator of that meeting. And then phase three was a survey. And actually I was missing phase four was a co-creation session. I'll tie it all together, but starting from, from the phase one, we could sit there and observe what the actual challenges are with a hybrid meeting. So mm -hmm. maybe the obvious things like tech, video tech is, is not straight away working or the sound is not, has echo or something. But then we could see the ergonomy of the rooms and how people were not ready to contribute from the actual meeting room to the what it was feeling like a remote meeting. I'll tell you more later. And then we would take a screenshots or actual pictures from different things that were surprising to us. And then in phase two, we would do a follow-up, but then very connected to the actual meeting that we saw. So we understood what the meeting was about because we were there. And then we would confront some of these participants with the observations we had. And then they would explain, hey, this picture, wow, I didn't realize this was happening this way. <laughs> and then we got very juicy quotes from mm -hmm. users who were kind of explaining or justifying why it was happening that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then phase three was about validating at scale what we observe in this, this whole phase. 
And phase four uh, was really fun because we invited the same participants, a selection of those participants, to hybrid co-creation. We created some challenges I call tech handicap uh, status. So then I would force some users to simply join from their phone. I would force some users to put their video off, uh, to try to emulate some of the realities that certain people go through. I force some users to use an interactive screen, even if they were at the office, even if they had their laptop with them. And then Miro executives were there. So it was a nice way of giving back and closing the loop with the learnings I got from all of the sessions. So they were all learning at the same time as we were learning. And later we created some early concept solutions or, or kind of explorations of what could work. So the four phases took somewhere like two months. And yeah, recruitment was a big part of, of that time. You teased it a little bit of, you know, there's the obvious things that can go wrong of video hiccups or echoes or whatever, but you mentioned there were some other things. What were some of the more surprising things that came up? To me, the most surprising thing was that people in the room who join a hybrid meeting, they are also experiencing a second class type of experience because the meeting is hybrid. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting because you may anticipate and expect that those joining remotely might feel excluded from certain things, certain interactions, certain abilities to interrupt the conversation or, or kind of raise their hands physically and, and get air time. But we actually saw that, especially when the majority of attendees were joining remotely, those in the room were kind of not getting any benefit from being in the room. They were potentially having to use their laptops on their laps because they were not in a proper meeting room. And they were really glued to their screen. And I wrote some quotes from there. For example, when I contrasted two of the participants who were in the physical room they, with a picture, they told me it is sad that we didn't look at each other in the entire meeting. So you are there with someone else, you are talking about the same topic and working on the same topic. And it's like, you're not together. You are joining virtually. And if anything, you need to use your actual headphones, not to disturb <laughs> and create echo. So there were, yeah, there were certain implications that we were not expecting to learn on, on that part, on that front. So trying to visualize, so you're in physical space in real life with people who are also together in real life as you know people are moving in real life again <laughs> for the people who are remote who are at home or wherever they are were you observing them too while you were in person with these others or were you were you focused on that experience as well or were you mostly focused on the experience of the in person people as part of this hybrid situation we were looking at both sides as we were two researchers doing the sessions. One of us was in the room, one of us was joining remote and we were observing like body language, what's happening in the chat, what's happening in the content tool and how much were they kind of contributing. And then we would follow up with one person from one side and one person from the other side. So that way we, we wouldn't reach and, and ensure that our observations and interpretations are accurate. So we could learn that, confirm that the person joining remote feels normally excluded from certain in-room in conversations, certain abilities to, to be visible, to be seen, to have an impact. But yeah, the surprising thing for us was also that the people joining the room were also having an experience that was not equally inclusive. So there were some challenges there. And this is all focusing on the during stage. But another surprising learning that we got was that in the prep stage, there were things that the facilitator could have anticipated and normally it, it didn't. So hmm. that meant hmm. I expected the group to join in this way, but they actually join in that other way. And they were unprepared to cater for that minority group that either didn't show up in the office or didn't join remotely, but they joined from the office. And there were certain uh, issues there to, to cater to, to them. So we understood that 
cultural norms are so important and, and having some working agreement between the team members joining the meeting was essential for them to be successful. Did you get any signal on like why people want to do the hybrid thing? Maybe I'm not phrasing this the right way, but like it seems a little silly, but if you know five of the attendees are in an office, they could just sit at their desk and join that way and, and just treat it like a remote meeting in the in the pandemic times. But is it sort of like, is there like an obligation or like a social norm thing of like, well, the five of us are in the same physical building, like we should get in the same meeting room, even if it's going to be a little clunky or like, what was the motivating factor in terms of that? Or did people think there was gonna be like some best of both worlds thing that um, they were hoping to unlock? So shockingly, we had one user that for one of the meetings we attended, he was at the office and he decided not to come to the meeting room because <laughs> of that reason. Like, he said, I know these people are glued to their screen. I'm better off joining remotely and getting full control of my experience versus mm -hmm. being there on the room. So I think it has to do with personality. It has to do with uh, how much do you uh, get out of being together with others and, mm -hmm. and what might be the conversations that you miss out if you don't join uh, in person. Mm -hmm. So one of the considerations we had was, Will people do two meetings, one for those joining remote mm. and one for those who are in the in the room? But uh, ultimately, the, the business needs to keep moving very fast. So there is no time that they can waste or, or afford to not duplicate the content. Right. So, yeah, at the end, at the end, we anticipated that hybrid was going to be a new way of working that was not just a short-term thing. We also validated mm -hmm. that in a, in a survey and we keep saying it that even if you mm -hmm. plan for a meeting that will happen in one way, then the, the reality tends to be that you get a mix of, of both audiences and it's really hard to cater to mm -hmm. both uh, equally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, did you see it in the other direction? We were mentioning like, you know, this hybrid model is going to be challenging. And so there's some surprising challenges that you learned. Did it go in the other way where actually some of it was like surprising how well it just sort of translated, like things that held up pretty well, even though it was a different sort of format? What we saw is that facilitators resource to the easiest way that they could. So if, if they can plan a remote meeting and at the end, some people turn up to show up in the office, then it's like a remote meeting adapted for hybrid, but in reality, is in essence, is a remote meeting uh, leading the thing. So it's optimized for remote participants. Or we saw the contrary. If you optimize for the pen and paper that you were saying before, and that was some of the comments that we got, then those joining remotely may end up uh, leaving the workshop halfway through. Especially a design thinking workshop with a lot of ideation and, and all. It was hard if the content and the ideas were not put in the digital space. They felt excluded, and and we also got some testimonials of, I left halfway through the through the workshop. So, yeah, that feels like a, a big failure of the system. Maybe obvious question, but I'm finding myself wondering. So you're watching all these meetings. Like, how many meetings did you watch? I guess <laughs> roughly like like seven or eight meetings. Seven or eight meetings, and these are like seven or eight different organizations, or. Yes. Okay. And are they using Miro in all these meetings or are you just like trying to zoom out and get a sense of hybrid meetings at large? We got around six of them using Miro and then a couple uh -huh. of them not using Miro. And it okay. was nice to see the, the contrast. Uh -huh. And you're like, if you use Miro. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So you mentioned earlier you had some themes and some learning objectives. Let's dig into those and what you learned. What did you learn from all this research? So on the one side, we, we saw how the devices that support hybrid are not equally served. And that means that you may join on the go a meeting and be, not be ready to kind of pull up your laptop and open up, you know, the mirror board mm -hmm. and they contribute. So the emphasis on on the go or personal devices was something that we uh, made big emphasis on during the research and then we, we identified there is a lot of opportunity here to serve. We also Is that mobile and iPads, like tablets? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mobile phones, yeah. iPads. They seem to be 
suitable devices to contribute to a meeting, but depending on, on the actions you need to take from those devices, you may be actually a bit limited to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We also confirm the, the lack of cultural norms, the lack of good references and, and kind of best practices. So think about the period when we did this. Teams were just going back to office. Maybe there was no expert guiding you with a checklist of things to to prep. So from there, we we work on a few articles to to guide middle users, especially. But yeah, it's in our website. Any users to to be more prepared for uh, their next hybrid meeting. And then the biggest learning was about how to make it more inclusive of mm-hmm. both audiences. So we tend to see that the person facilitating optimize for one of the two audiences, either the remote or the in-room. In and there was no an obvious way to, to serve equally well uh, both audiences. So we also identified that dichotomy and explored different concepts or directions to to see how we can serve both both audiences, both groups. Are there ways to serve both audiences without making it worse for both? <laughs> like, is are you? Does it become a like least common denominator? You know what I mean? Where we'll make it like yes. least bad for everybody, but not great for anybody. Or are there actually ways to make it kind of work for? everybody or are we still early in that and we're still figuring out what that looks like i think we're all still figuring it figuring it out the common denominator was exactly one of the things i quoted in in the report mm-hmm. it feels like a missed opportunity no so if you are in the room you want the energy in the room you want the, mm-hmm. the creativity to spark but then if you mm-hmm. need to keep making pauses and making sure that you hear the other part then maybe things don't don't flow as well if you are remote, you want to benefit from breakout groups, from simultaneous conversations going on, from keeping a track of everything that is being said, recording what's being said, and then you may not actually see what's happening in the room or, or hear clearly who said what. So there were obvious challenges that we anticipated beforehand, but then by putting it all together and connecting the dots, we could see, hey, there is here a space that we can try and solve. You mentioned the facilitator optimizing for, you know, in-person or remote, um, some tendencies there. How much does that correlate with just like where the facilitator is going to be? Like if I'm going to be in person, I'm going to optimize for in person. If I'm going to be remote, I'm going to optimize for remote. Or did they do it more on like how many participants were joining through, you know, one way or the other? So if the majority of the meetings be remote, they optimize for that even though they're in person. Just, just curious how that comes to be. So what we saw is that people come in from that working from home at that time were optimizing for what they were used to do, which is a yeah, remote their situation. Yeah. So they, they kind of got a, a, a remote meeting and projected the screen in the room and did not serve well the people who were sitting in that room because maybe without them having their laptops with them, they would not be able to actually see or contribute or, or add. So we tend to see that that was the case, like remote meetings being just expanded to those who join uh, in person. Mm-hmm. But then there was this problem of that second class experience for those in the room. And, and they were demanding, like, what's the benefit for, for me to actually come to the office? And at that time, it was all on a voluntary basis, joining to the office or not. Uh, there were some safety concerns. Mm-hmm. So they were questioning and, and it was an open kind of dialogue, like, should we come to the office at all? And then that correlates a bit with the future of work and, and some trends that we are seeing into how, yeah, the workforce may want to have the autonomy to choose where they work from. And, and yeah, that puts everything in, in flux and you mm-hmm. cannot decide how how things will turn out to be. So uh, one of the uh, features that we really like, Google, is uh, the Google Calendar. You can actually select if you're planning to join in person or if you're mm-hmm. planning to join remotely. And if you do that, you can give heads up to the facilitator to prepare, like, do I need co-facilitators? Do I need mm-hmm. to adapt my timings? Because breaks are, are also super important. We confirm all of the Zoom fatigue, et cetera. 
but maybe if you're not experiencing the meeting in the same way that participants are, you may be a little far from their reality and maybe they, they need a, an energy booster, a break or, or, or something. So it's really hard to cater to both audiences if, if you need to keep all of those balls um, uh, on the air. Do you, having lived in this world for a while and been thinking about it so deeply, do you have any like predictions or, you know, hot takes of how hybrid meetings are going to evolve if you had to like guess or, or how you'd hope they would evolve? It's hard. I recently I've used a few new pieces of tech. I think one of them is called Nest. And then they split the camera in the room into small parts. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is Owl, like the... Yeah, I've heard of that. And then in that way, you can give a sense of body language and who is talking to those joining remote. But I tend to see that those in the room have a uh, little visibility into what's happening to remote participants. So it's really hard to bring their presence. Uh, there are solutions like telepresence solutions, but <laughs> not working really well. So I cannot fully anticipate what's happening, but I, I keep saying it is complex. It tends to exclude people from doing their best work. So finding solutions and, and also working agreements to make it work is an essential piece. Do we get to a better place by, you know, throwing technological solutions at these hybrid meetings or by reconfiguring like how we work remotely or in person to try to mitigate some of the underlying issues? So, right, if it's always going to be a challenge to have the minority group and the majority group of the remote or in person, do you try to lessen that by saying, like, for example, some teams are saying, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're in office days. We're going to, you know, have our meetings together on those days or majority together and then take advantage of the flexibility and, you know, lack of commute and some of those benefits of remote on the other days to try to mitigate the hybridness of the hybrid, right? Yeah. How do you see? I, yeah, I see, I see that there is a, a factor of randomness that mm. we cannot control, even if there are official in office. Right, days. right. And then that requires us to be over-prepared when we facilitate, yeah. be able to compromise if that's necessary. The trend that we are seeing, and that is looking at also macro data from the way that users are using the product, is that there is a, an increasing async collaboration. Yeah. So preparing work ahead of time and then reducing the amount of meetings that we have to do and shortening the duration of meetings to make sure that we make uh, the decisions that we need to make or that we hear the different perspectives that we need to hear and then potentially reconvene after all of that has been put together. So to give you an example, in a formal workshop that you are diverging and later converging and clustering all in the meeting, we may see that users are splitting it into two, they first diverge, then someone will take the lead asynchronously, cluster things, ask for input and comments, potentially even vote asynchronously, and then they get together and then they prioritize the final kind of decisions or solutions that they will go forward with. That somehow yeah. answers that this space continues to be underserved and continues to be complex and that maybe tech alone is not going to solve the right, challenge. Right. Yeah, I was at a UX conference, UX Y'all, last week in ah. North Carolina, and a couple of people presented on like facilitator tips for doing this type of thing. And it was really interesting. A lot of what you just touched on was some, were some of their biggest takeaways, where if you have people across a lot of time zones and in-person remote, like try to actually break that out somehow and like let the remote people have a session, let the in-person people have a session, or do it async, and then find a way once like, some of the ideation and prep work has been done, that kind of maximizes the format that those people are interacting in, then get everybody together for the meeting that maybe is a little suboptimal in some ways, but you've you've maximized the the pros where you can. But I don't think people have that playbook figured out, but it seems like there is there's something to that approach that will probably continue to emerge. I would like to quote a friend of mine, David Jenkins, who just got a book called a Collaboration in a Digital World. And one of the big threats that he identified in, in his research and published in his book is people are being forced to confront unknowns and they struggle with the new technology, the digital work fatigue, experience poor relationships and battle technology failure. 
So I think that challenge captures really well the, the dichotomy we're talking about. This is about uh, compromising because you want to build relationships that are meaningful and then you go to the office. It's about compromising because you may need your autonomy and preference to work from home and then you still want to contribute. And then the people facilitating this collaboration uh, needs to find the best way to cater to both audiences and actually move the project forward. So yeah, it's, it's pretty challenging. Yeah. I'm thinking about how, you know, this, this whole situation does put a lot of pressure on facilitators, you know, people running meetings and maybe the silver lining is, you know, cause at the end of the day, it's about inclusion, right? It's about, you know, how do you try your best to make the experience as good as possible for people in these different contexts and so if you can try your best to do that, at least have some empathy for what is it like to be in this scenario or that scenario, you'll probably be imperfect in, in how you address it. But if you're trying, it probably makes you a better facilitator for easier meetings too, right? Just like having that mindset of how do I make this meeting a not terrible experience for the people in this meeting? You know, that's not necessarily a mindset people are always bringing to meetings. So maybe, maybe making it harder to do that, it gives you a better result overall somehow well i'm seeing the way that working teams especially product teams are collaborating and they tend to to see the same faces in the meetings so some good tips and practices that they have put forward is making the responsibility of include everyone in the meeting a shared responsibility it's not no longer mm -hmm. facilitator's responsibility mm -hmm. But everyone may interject and say, hey, let's let's see what Jay needs to say about this or what are your thoughts on this, uh, Erin? And then making sure that everybody gets the chance to, to mm -hmm. share their mm -hmm. thoughts. And, and I think that is important to, to arrive to those working agreements and to constantly ask for feedback after you are doing like important milestones or important meetings to ensure that yeah, you are not missing out on the perspectives of, of the entire group. From doing this researcher-led research, where you kind of got to initiate, like, here's a big thing we need to understand, kind of lay out these phases and this mixed methods approach. Any reflections on that? Like, are the things that you did in that approach that worked really well, or the things you would have done differently, like having gone through it? Or I guess advice to researchers who maybe will find themselves in a similar boat someday. Well, the first reflection is to, to believe in yourself. Uh, we tend to have this intuition, this hunch, and often it gets diluted in a conversation. It gets diluted in the day-to-day -day kind of pressure and stress. So when you are convinced about the opportunity or about something not being right, then we are in a privileged position to to give a space to our curiosity and and jump into the unknown and and really explore. So I think that attitude and mindset is is the first advice that I can give. Like just don't give up if you see that something might not be right for your users or in your product or in your company. Just persist and, and keep pushing mm -hmm. because maybe that will uh, give some fruits, no? In in the in the short term or in the long term. The second was something that I, I clearly think that went really well, which is find allies early on. And that will ensure that they trust your outcome, that they trust your insights because they have been part of the process. They, they are already invested in it. And that's, that's a tip now I gave to the researchers I work with. Because if you do all of the great work on your own and then you come with the result and just, like throw it at your stakeholders, they may not buy into it. So just get them early on is, is really important. And then the third piece was a thorough plan and, and just resilience to, to go through it. And to do that, we had to put on hold some other research requests. So I had the support of my manager, like the great head of research that we have at Miro Dalia to say, hey, don't you worry, now you're on this. Mm -hmm. And you too, like, boy, and you are on this. So uh, it was it was good to have that protection and especially belief no? and trust from the head of research to actually accomplish this. Yeah, I think what you said about the bringing in the out, like your allies and stakeholders early is, 
we've done, I don't know, a hundred something of these episodes now. And that's come up in some flavor through so many conversations of like, you got to bring people on the journey or else it's, it's really tough to get people to support and, and actually then make use of the research. Right. So uh, I love that tip. Totally. Yeah. And also do research at an organization that believes in research. <laughs> that also helps. That, that also helps. Yeah. Cool. Eduardo, any closing thoughts on hybrid research state of the world? I believe we are now in a really great position to do again, in-person ethnographies. Like last year was a bit early. It was a bit challenging, but I think this is going to open so many opportunities and not just mm -hmm. for SaaS and productivity tools, but many, many different industries. So I think it's a very exciting time to, to be in the field and, and to explore the unknown and to, to shape how different solutions mm -hmm. and, and things will, will evolve. So yeah, very excited about what's to come. Likewise. Eduardo, thanks for joining us. Thanks for hanging out. Fantastic. Thank you for having me here.